Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our March installment of Public Health Speaker Series. My name is Angela Hobson, and I serve as the Associate Dean for Public Health here at the Brown School. And I am so honored today to welcome everybody here and to welcome our um, guest for our, our talk this afternoon, Dr. Rachel Winograd. Um, I'm going to give her a, give an introduction for her, and then I'll turn the mic over to her. She'll do um, the usual. We'll do our talk, um, and she'll present for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for question and answers at the end. Also want to welcome Welcome everybody who's joining us virtually. So thanks to all of those on Zoom that are join me, joining. Of course, if you have questions, you can put those in the chat and we will um, try to answer those as well as the in-person questions as we get to that later. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Rachel. Dr. Rachel Winograd is a licensed clinical psychologist and an associate professor within the Department of Psychological Sciences and the Missouri Institute of Mental Health at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Her clinical research and program development interests revolve around interventions to save and improve the lives of people who use drugs. Currently, her primary focus is on expanding access to medical treatment, harm reduction strategies, and person-centered approaches for those most in need of evidence-based care for substance use disorders in Missouri. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I will try not to be super awkward with the hybrid format. Um, so bear with me. Uh, today, I am going to be giving an overview of the landscape of our current drug overdose crisis here in our home state of Missouri, highlight some efforts specifically uh, addressing stimulant use, the rising uh, stimulant involved death rate that we are witnessing, do a deeper dive on the racial disparities we're seeing in uh, overdose deaths and access to services, and then end by looking ahead at some positive things that are happening and what we can be doing next. So before we get into data and numbers and strategies and findings and this and that, I'd like to humanize our talk a little bit and ask for your participation in a little activity. So uh, can you please get out a little piece of paper and pen, if anybody still carries paper and pen, a phone a notes app will suffice if that's what you have going for you. Zoom friends, uh, this applies to you too, please. Okay, so be ready to write down a little list. So what I'd like you to uh, write down at the top of your piece of paper, please, uh, is your drug of choice. So when I say a drug of choice, I will remind you that alcohol is a drug, caffeine is a drug. We can think about sugar as a drug, nicotine, as well as opioids, heroin, cocaine, cannabis, whatever. Write that down. Okay. Now below it, for the next minute or so, I'd like you to write down all the positive things that that drug brings you, the positive feelings or skills or mindsets. What does it do for you? Okay, now uh, are there any brave souls either in person or on Zoom who'd like to share one or two things on their list, not their drug of choice, please, but just one of the effects? Angela, routine, what else? Social connection, sleep, Creativity. 
focused mindset, serotonin, energy, wonderful. Okay, sure, one more. What? Coping mechanism, yes. Okay, now at the top of your list, please scratch out the drug that you wrote and instead write my needs. And I'd like you to look down your list again with that different framing. Okay, so why are we doing this? I think it's really important before we have any conversation about a drug overdose crisis and addiction and treatment and deficit to ground us in the reality that people use drugs for reasons. We use drugs to meet our needs, very real human needs that we have in this world. And if and when we are ever in a clinical setting or a public health setting where we are asking people to stop using drugs or reduce their drug use, we need to openly acknowledge that they will go without getting those needs met. And we better have some suggestions and help and support for them to get their needs met in other ways. At the end of the day, humans are relatively rational beings. We have always used drugs and we will always use drugs and we will always employ creative strategies to get our needs met. So as we go forward today, let's keep that in mind. We are all drug users in some way, shape or fashion but some of us are more likely to suffer negative consequences from our drug use than others. Okay. So a brief synopsis of where we're at in this country in terms of our drug overdose crisis. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly because I'm assuming that we're a pretty informed audience. We can always get back in the weeds if we need to. We saw a big jump in deaths during the first year of COVID. That increase continued in 2021. Nationally, we saw a 16% increase in 2021. In Missouri, that increase was less than average. Uh, so around 11%, still horrific, uh, but less than the national average. The most recent data we have from CDC suggests, again, there was still a national increase in 2022 but you'll see Missouri actually decreased. We were one of a handful of, of blue states, at least blue in this uh, way. Um, and you'll see later today that it, it looks like that trend is continuing or it is, is solidly uh, reliable in Missouri, at least for the, the first half of 2022. Okay, what is causing these deaths? Fentanyl has absolutely been driving the recent increase in deaths especially from 2016 onward. Uh, here in Missouri, we got hit by fentanyl in 2016. We experienced a 35% increase in overdose deaths that year alone. It was really driven by an increase in deaths in the St. Louis area. Uh, and fentanyl wave has really hit from East Coast and has moved on westward. Dan Ciccaroni out of UCSF has coined the three waves of the overdose crisis that we've been seeing since the mid-90s, starting with prescription opioids, moving on to heroin as we've really cracked down on opioid prescribing, which remember has unintended consequences in other realms and drives people to an underground illicit market. As we've increased enforcement on heroin, the iron law of prohibition suggests that our drug supply gets more compact, more potent, and more powerful. That brings about a huge market for fentanyl, which is really small and potent and powerful. It makes sense from every angle that we can think of, from an economic angle, from drug sellers, drug users. It's like concentrate juice. If I can get a little bit of it, it's cheaper. It stretches farther. I can transport it in my glove compartment in this size of a box versus needing tractor trailers full of uh, space to ship heroin, for example, let alone the fields of opium poppies to harvest, which is not needed when you can make uh, fentanyl with illicit precursors in an underground laboratory. So all this to say fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that has absolutely dominated our drug market and it's not going anywhere. As we continue to increase 
our drug enforcement and our efforts for interdiction to catch people who are selling and using drugs, that only increases the incentive for drugs to get smaller and more potent and more powerful and more deadly. What are we seeing in Missouri? I'm breaking this out by regions. Uh, one thing I know of, uh, after at least going to graduate school in Missouri, uh, I did not get as much education about what was actually happening in my community, in my state, as I wish I did. So that is one of the things that I try to do in my work, and I've done a lot of work on the job about learning what are the regions in Missouri? What are county and governmental and jurisdictional structures like? It's really important if you're trying to make change in the state that you're living in to actually know a bit about what's happening in your state. Turns out out. Okay, so uh, you can see at the top, this uh, is the St. Louis metro area. Uh, this is a, gra a figure from 2019 through 2021. We're about to get full year 2022 data, but uh, I unfortunately don't have it yet. You can see it's pretty dramatic that St. Louis is leading the pack, not in a good way in terms of our counts of drug-related deaths. Now, to be clear, St. Louis is also the most populated region of our state, which means it's also important to look at rates per 100,000. Even when you look at rates, St. Louis Metro is still on top, uh, where we have almost double the, the rate of the next highest region. You can see overall that since 2019, there has been a somewhat steady increase across most regions, though there are some differences with some regions seeing an increase between 2020 and 2021 that was steeper than what we saw here in St. Louis where it did kind of plateau. Now, I'm, I'm going through these because we, we want to get to talk about what we're actually doing. Um, I also, I should have said this at the top, um, but let me say it now because better late than never. As many of you, uh, probably you probably share this when you're working in the field of public health or psychology or social work where we're dealing with data and numbers and figures a lot of the time about like really serious devastating stuff we get a little bit desensitized to it and you can whip through graphs and figures and stats and tallies without acknowledging the humans that are behind them so forgive me i meant to do that at the top and i didn't uh I'm showing all these graphs about trends and rates and things like that, but each of these data points are human beings who's who died preventable deaths. And family members, friends, neighbors lost someone they love and care for, and it was the biggest thing that happened in those people's lives. And it's happening multiple times a day, every single day. Uh, we can barely keep track. Um, so I don't want that to get lost in the discussion of, of data and trends and um, population health that we're still dealing with individuals. So moving on, when we're talking about what people are dying of, we have really focused heavily on opioid overdose, and rightfully so for the last 10 years or so. Opioid-involved deaths have been you know, one of the biggest public health crises of our lifetime. Opioids have absolutely driven the overdose death crisis that we are witnessing. However, it is not just opioids. And we uh, lose ourselves if we make all our responses opioid-centric. So I do want to highlight the role, the increasing role of stimulants and stimulant-involved deaths. Between uh, in 2021, we saw almost a 13% increase in opioid deaths, but a 24% increase in stimulant involved deaths, and a 26% increase in deaths that involved a combination of stimulants and opioids. This is happening all over the country. We are seeing more poly drug deaths, meaning more than one class of substances involved in a death, with the largest growth happening with this particular combo, opioids and stimulants. So what is going on? Now, I will remind us that when we're only dealing with death data, medical examiner toxicology data, we don't know a person's story. All we know is what is in their system. So if we see the presence of opioids and stimulants, we don't know exactly how that came to be, but that's why we work with other researchers, ethnographers, qualitative researchers who work directly with people who use drugs to get a better sense of what's happening. 
what we do know is that fentanyl is absolutely the most common opioid driver in these deaths that involve stimulants. And we also know that it can be helpful to group these into two overarching buckets. One is intentional consumption of both types of substances. So this could be immediate co-use in the moment. Uh, you may have heard the term of a speedball, that's heroin and cocaine, or modern day, we might call it a goofball, which is methamphetamine and fentanyl. So this is when you're literally using both drugs in the moment because using them together gives you a different beneficial effect than using just one or the other. The other option under the bucket of intentional uh, consumption is concurrent or recent use, meaning I might not be using them both in the same sitting, but I'm probably using them both throughout the same day or 24 hour period. So for example, at the height of evictions in early COVID days, we heard about a lot of people who were predominantly opioid users who would then lost their place of residence. They lost their shelter and they were forced to live on the streets and they started using methamphetamine to stay up at night, to stay safe and guard their stuff. So that's an example of people who might use both substances within the same day, but not necessarily for a synergistic effect. Then there's another category, and people love to talk mostly about this one, and this is unintentional co-use. This is when people think they're using stimulants, and oops, there's actually fentanyl in there. And within that bucket, there are also two offshoots. It can either be done unknowingly or knowingly. So if the supply is contaminated unknowingly, this we think is the most common occurrence under this broad bucket, rather than some like really uh, strategic malice going up high levels of a drug supply chain, for example. So what I mean by contaminated unknowingly is let's think about our illicit drug market and how drugs get packaged and handed off from different levels of seller to seller. People might be in an apartment on a table that's probably pretty messy. They might be bagging up a little, some fentanyl in one part of the day and then later in the day bagging up some cocaine. If you do not wipe down the table, you can get fentanyl in the cocaine. If you're using the same blender and you don't wash out the blender, you can get fentanyl in the cocaine. If you are using a wooden table with uh, seams, oh, what's the word for wooden creases? You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. My father-in-law is a woodworker would be very disappointed in me. Um, you know, there can be drugs that stick around in those crevices and you try to pack drugs on top of it and all of a sudden it infiltrates. So that is what we think is the most likely source of unknown contamination is something went wrong during the, the mixing process. The other option, and this is what people love to talk about, especially enforcement, is that there's a supply that's laced on purpose, meaning drug sellers at some place in the supply chain are adding fentanyl into stimulants for a particular reason. Now, this doesn't make a ton of sense economically. Why would a drug seller want to trick their customers and potentially kill them, knowing that people who are only used to using stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamine, and they do not have any physical tolerance for opioids, if you all of a sudden get a dose of fentanyl, that can absolutely be deadly. So why, why would that happen? It's hard to explain, but we put it up on here because it, it's worth mentioning that we've heard you know a couple anecdotes here and there. It, it certainly could be happening, but we do not want to propagate the myth that this is happening on some sort of large scale. Regardless of the reason, some of these lessons are the same. You know, the, the term equifinality, it's like we get to the same place regardless of whatever these reasons may be. And that is that our drug supply is becoming less and less predictable and that we have some tools that should be used and adopted no matter what drug of choice people are using if they're getting drugs from the illicit market. So specifically, drug checking is important. There are emerging technologies around the country allowing people to rapidly test exactly what's in their drugs. We do not have this technology here in Missouri. I'll hopefully get a chance to touch on that later, uh, largely because it is illegal to do so. Uh, but we also do have fentanyl test strips, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, also, people who use stimulants should have naloxone too. So a reminder, naloxone is the opioid overdose antidote. 
It can come in a syringe and vial or a nasal spray like Flonase. We give it out from our team across the state. And it used to only be really marketed to people who use opioids because this is an opioid overdose reversal medication. But nowadays, we also try to target people who use stimulants or buy other things from the illicit market, pressed pills, benzos, anything online, because it absolutely could have fentanyl in it and it's worth having naloxone on hand. So what's being done to address the stimulant wave? Uh, there are a number of initiatives and efforts that have been launched in the last year or so across the state. I'm not going to go into too much depth on this top one, but it's worth referencing that we do not have a ton of great treatments for stimulant use disorder. So one thing that I often talk about, which I'll only highlight briefly at the end today, is the robustness of medications that we have to treat opioid use disorder, treatment medications, specifically methadone and buprenorphine, most notably. We do not have those types of medications for stimulant use disorder. We have some things that doctors might try to prescribe off-label, but nothing that is as effective as the meds we have for OUD. So that means we have to ugh, be more creative uh, and more intentional about the treatments that we deliver to people who present with stimulant use disorder. And one of the most promising psychosocial treatments is including contingency management in existing psychosocial treatment modalities. Contingency management is based on behaviorism. It's essentially reinforcing people for positive behaviors. So we work closely with the Missouri Department of Mental Health to pilot contingency management currently at six treatment sites across the state. Uh, they have limited funds to essentially reward people for coming back, for engaging in treatment, for showing up, uh, there's plenty of evidence showing that contingency management can be effective when done well and correctly and with fidelity. A problem that we're still grappling with is that while the feds in 2021 said that federal grantees can now start delivering contingency management and using federal funds, which is like paying people to do treatment, which you can imagine some people bristle at. So it is bribing, like, okay, it works. Behaviorism is real. Okay, but so they say you can do this, but we're going to put a cap on the amount of money you can spend on it. So you can only pay people a maximum of $75 per year, which is not very much at the end of the day. It's certainly if you space out $75 across a year of treatment attendance, that amount of reinforcement cannot even come close to competing with the amount of enforcement that one gets from using drugs. So if that were offered to me, I'd be like, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to stick with what I've got. What we've been able to do is work with the state to adopt a bit more of a harm reduction approach to our contingency management pilot with two main strategies. One is that we don't allow treatment providers to reinforce abstinence, meaning no urine drug test is going to say whether or not you get this $5 gift card. All you have to do is show up and participate and you get the gift card. The second thing we're doing is condensing the reinforcement schedule to only last for the first month of treatment. So that $75 packs a little bit more of a punch. $75 in a month might be worth shooting for. Uh, and then the hope is that there would be enough intrinsic motivation that people would stay engaged in treatment. Treatment programs took a while to ramp this up. We're just now starting to get some claims data in on how it's going. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to share more on that at a later date. We're also really expanding our harm reduction efforts for stimulant users. Uh, so first, we're developing a lot of printed and live training and educational resources. I'll give some snapshots of the types of things that our team has developed in close collaboration with our community partners. And we're also distributing and educating a lot about fentanyl test strips, prioritizing people who predominantly use stimulants for the reasons that I shared. We are not targeting our fentanyl test strips to people who are predominantly opioid users because at this point, the entire opioid supply has fentanyl in it. It's, you're not going to get much new information. Uh, so we had to be strategic with a limited resource. And of course, we are also continuing to distribute a crap ton of naloxone. So uh, our team at UMSL, I run the addiction science team. We are now the naloxone hub for the state of Missouri. So we get a lot of funding from the state to purchase mass amounts of naloxone, both Narcan, the nasal spray, and intramuscular naloxone in a syringe and vial to 
deliver, ship, hand off, mail, mail is also ship. I don't, we get it out there across the state, um, both through our team and through our contracted partners. So here's a snapshot of some of the impact. You'll see this map is um, sort of a, a heat map showing the amount of naloxone that different counties have received from us in the last couple of years. And then down here, you'll see a breakdown by sectors, types of agency sectors. So we are in charge of a lot of distribution to other agencies and organizations for them to then distribute to the people who they care for. So our group is not necessarily giving it out to individuals on the street. We work with people who then do that. But it, we've learned a ton about scaling up mass supply distribution efforts. None of us uh, were trained in any of that uh, during school or, or our initial job. So we've done a lot of learning on our feet of how to get this life-saving resource out across to every corner of Missouri in the, the most creative and intentional ways possible. So just this morning, uh, I was talking in my harm reduction, my community harm reduction naloxone team, and they were saying we, they've been getting a lot of requests recently from like groups that we haven't heard about. So this morning they were saying someone must have put something out on some gymnastics listserv because we got like 18 requests from different gym gymnastics studios across the state. And they were saying they are reviving overdoses like at their parking lot or on their premises. We also are getting a lot of requests from pawn shops across the country, which has been an interesting in, especially into small rural communities. Um, we're hearing from some law firms and public defender firms across the state. Um, so it really is also about who the relationships that my team members are building with people across the state, because you know your own neighborhood and community best and who's going to be the most likely person or agency to have contact with people who are actively using drugs. Because at the end of the day, they are the real first responders. Who is actually on the scene? Who is the person who would pick up the phone to call 911? They're the person who should have naloxone because we just don't have that kind of time to mess with when we're talking about fentanyl overdoses, which can take effect in a matter of seconds. Okay, I'm also gonna talk about fentanyl test strip distribution. This has been a newer initiative for us. Uh, thus far, we've distributed over 135 test strips in the last uh, little over a year. Um, we did the first 25,000 in a pilot just to get a sense of how we could set up our request system, how we would get a sense of who would get them and what agencies, how the agencies would use them. Um, so I will say research and evaluation of this effort is deeply in progress. Specifically, there's a decent amount of research out there about how people who use drugs use fentanyl test strips to largely either test their drugs or test their urine after they've used drugs. But there's very little to no research on the people who are actually giving them out. How does that conversation go? What training did you have beforehand? How receptive are your participants? Are they coming back for more? What feedback do you get? How was the organizational culture when you all started this initiative? So we are surveying all the agencies who we supplied to get some of that information back to then improve our efforts in the next round and the next round. So what do we do with our fentanyl test strips? Fentanyl test strips are tiny little paper strips that look like this. There's, uh, If there's just one line on it, that means fentanyl is present. If there's two lines, that means fentanyl is not present. So again, these are not like super sophisticated mass chromatography tests that tell you like every ingredient. It's just a positive or negative. Um, so what we distribute with each pack of five strips uh, are two different handouts. One is from Dance Safe, a harm reduction partner of ours, uh, about how to test your drugs for fentanyl. And the other one is how to test your urine for fentanyl. Now, why am I even talking about the second one? Here's where we enter a bit of a legal gray area. So in Missouri, remember how I said we have a statute that said is it, it is illegal. This is in our in our broad drug paraphernalia statute, the same one that that makes syringes for for uh, controlled substance in, in ingestion illegal. It is also illegal to test your drugs for the purposes of ingestion. However, it is not illegal to test your urine after you've already used the drugs. So that is how we distribute fentanyl test strips. We put this flyer, how to test for fentanyl on the outside, and we are very clear in all our public communications that this is why we are giving them out and this is why it is legal for us to do so. 
However, we acknowledge that sometimes it might be too late to say, I want to test my urine after I used fentanyl. The presumption there would be that you have to still be alive to be able to do that. And that many people, especially in states where this is totally legal, prefer to test their drugs prior to consumption. Because we know that people do that and they're going to do that anyway, we feel an obligation to include these instructions as well. So if you're going to test your drugs for fentanyl, here's how to do it safely. So we have five fentanyl test strips that we wrap in two sets of instructions and put paper clips around. Originally, when we petitioned the state to give us funding to do this, we were like, this should be easy peasy, no problem. Uh, we'll be able to get these out this summer. Turns out uh, we were in way over our heads and we had to get a lot of help and volunteers in packing up these tens of thousands of fentanyl test strip kits and getting them out across the country. Uh, so this has been one of our learning curves is realizing how much human time and capital it takes to get these harm reduction resources out there. And somebody's got to do them. Either we do them on our team and ship it out to small grassroots harm reduction organizations who can then give them out quickly, or we ship them out just with loose materials, and then they have to pack them up, which is a lot to be asking of understaffed, under-resourced harm reduction teams. So as you can see here, we elicited student volunteers to help us. Uh, some of us who had children also got their assistance. Uh, you'll see my three kids depicted here. I did pay my oldest five cents a kit. Um, my two youngest here were uh, not as helpful. Um, and I think they packed maybe three and I will not be working with them again uh, on this. Okay, from our 25,000 test strip pilot, uh, here's just a quick snapshot of what we distributed across the state. From this data, we then are uh, we then went back and built what we refer to as a fentanyl test strip distribution algorithm so that in our next waves, we would be able to ask the right questions and then sort of tier each organization based on their need. And that was based on overdose rates in their region, how many people they serve per month, how many stimulant users they serve per month, how many people who are uninsured uh, you know, are engaged in their services? Do they conduct street outreach or are they only in-house? Things like that factored into our decision. Um, so you can see we tried not to smother St. Louis as much as we often do, again, because we were really wanting to reach far across the state, specifically stimulant users, which are largely also in rural areas across the state who have not received as many resources from recent opioid focus funds. Here's a breakdown of the types of organizations that we supplied. Uh, you can see I can get into the balance here. Sometimes there were large organizations who served a ton of people, but maybe they weren't as harm reduction focused. So you have to balance that between the need of a small harm reduction organization that doesn't have as big a footprint. Okay, we have also created a lot of stimulant focused harm reduction messaging and training. So uh, here, uh, who you have here are Leslie Weinstein. She's actually the one I learned that needs exercise from early on. Reverend Burton Barr and Pastor Pam. These are three of our community consultants. We are growing this team. I think um, at the end of this month, we will have 23 community consultants across the state. These folks are largely people who have their own history with drug use and addiction and are coming now to give back to their communities, whether that's delivering one-on-one -on -one street outreach in their neighborhoods, conducting trainings for organizations. Like today, I think Pastor Pam is doing one of our first rounds of trainings for the St. Louis City Public Housing Authority to get naloxone into all their buildings. I'll come back to that later. Um, anyway, and so they inform everything we do related to harm reduction and outreach. Some of these flyers that were uh, led mostly by uh, my colleague Aaron Ruiz on our team, uh, there was an acknowledgement that so much of our harm reduction resources were really opioid focused and we're really leaving out stimulant users. So we have one on over amping, which is sort of the equivalent of overdose, if you will, for people who take too many stimulants and things get really hot and heated and wild. How do you deescalate? How do you make sure people are safe and healthy? Playing safe on the ice, if we're talking about crystal meth, safer crack smoking tips. Uh, and we're also working uh, with local agencies who are starting to do actual safer crack smoking supply distribution. Okay, so let's transition to this next part. I have not hit this too much yet, but this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. 
we are facing extreme racial inequities and overdose death. And there is a connection between the racial over the racial disparities in overdose and uh, the changing drug supply. So here in Missouri, you can find this uh, figure on the DHSS opioid dashboard if you're interested. But when you break out drug overdose deaths by sex and race, you see that black males are absolutely far and away above uh, white females, white males, and black females. Uh, this is not only happening in Missouri, it's happening across the country in the last few years, especially among older black men. You're seeing, you're seeing more and more studies showing that while the opioid, quote unquote, opioid crisis largely had a white face on it for many of the ops in 2000 teens, we are absolutely seeing black communities be harder hit uh, by the fentanyl wave. If we look just locally here in St. Louis City and County, it truly holds bare. So you see this top line is black men who die within St. Louis city limits. The rate of death is 340 per 100,000. And this is 15 times higher than the national average. The rate of death among black men in St. Louis city is one of, if not the highest rate of death in the entire country. You'll see this pattern holds when we look at deaths that combine opioids and stimulants. It's black men in the city and the county who are in this blue and pink line from the last few years. Skyrocketing rates. Yes. Yes. Yes, we are only looking at overdose deaths here. Uh, here is a map our team is trying to uh, get our toe into the geospatial mapping world uh, ever so gently. Um, and there's a lot of stories that you can tell and a lot of information you can gain by looking at the geographic scope and impact of these deaths. So what you see here uh, is a map of the prevalence um, from since 2011. And if you work with these maps interactively, you can see a story unfold over time of how locations of deaths have changed and clusters have changed over the last 10 years, and specifically now targeting North St. Louis, north of Del Mar. So I want to take this moment to highlight a local event that many of you hopefully heard about a little over a year ago that brings a lot of this home. So the Parkview Apartments are right here in the Central West End, just down the street. It's a public housing complex operated, owned and operated by HUD, but actually managed by an independent private property management company. Uh, so this is a a uh, low income, many people on disability, many people with all sorts of co-occurring conditions, lots of poverty, uh, reside and visit this public housing complex. In the span of 36 hours, nine people died of overdose. They were all black and they were all middle-aged to older. All of them thought they were purchasing crack cocaine and there was fentanyl in it and everyone in this group died. There was no naloxone on site. There was no one sounding an alarm bell, no one to come to their aid. There are so many layers of this that we could dissect in terms of systemic racism, disinvestment, poverty, class, how, how the enforcement. There was also a, a rumor going around that uh, people who had been purchasing these drugs were used to purchasing from the same person. Uh, and that person purchased from a, a typical supplier, but that there had been a big drug bust just the week before, arresting that supplier and getting him off the streets, which leaves a vacuum for someone new to come in with an unpredictable supply, doesn't have the existing relationships, there's no mutual trust going on, and people are really falling prey to whatever may be uh, what he's holding. So there is absolutely national research showing that when there are big drug busts, overdose rates actually go up. So that's something to remember about the ripple effects of interdiction and supply side interventions. But regardless, Parkview Apartments, you know, there were this, there was sort of a neighborhood clamoring. There was some media activity, a lot of people sounding alarm bells, but very little action. Our teams and 
community partners tried to get in with property management, say, we'll give you naloxone, we'll train you, let us in, let us train the residents, let's go to door to door, we'll park our outreach van outside, nothing. We had one meeting, never heard back from them. Total inaction, same thing from the city. Uh, not until this past February, less a month ago, actually today, February 6th, when our team released a statement commemorating, you know, one year has passed and what has changed? Nothing. Even ground zero, this apartment complex doesn't have naloxone on site still. So once we went to the media with that, turns out that can be helpful. We then got the executive director of St. Louis Public Housing Authority on the line. She's in, she's like, no one told me about this. I'm committed to changing. And like I said, just today, we are now launching trainings for the entire public housing authority of the city of St. Louis so that every public housing complex has naloxone on site. And then our outreach teams can get in and train residents. But this is the type of thing that you would think should be common sense. We have a bunch of free naloxone. Here's an area of high need. How come the motivation and incentive isn't there? You tell me. Is it that we don't value the lives of drug users? especially poor black drug users, I'd venture to say so. So there's absolutely a warranted focus on St. Louis, given what I've shared with you already. Uh, the center initiative is something I wanna highlight. Here you'll see quickly that in every region in the state, there are racial inequities in overdose, meaning the pink bars are slightly higher than the blue bars. But the, the panel for the St. Louis Metro absolutely has the highest racial inequity, so it makes sense that we start here. The Center Initiative is a three-year grant that my team and partners and I run with funding from the Missouri Foundation for Health. We partner with the T, Family Care Health Centers, Integrated Health Network, Behavioral Health Network of St. Louis, Community Health Work Coalition, and Regional Health Commission. We have five main pillars, which you'll see here. I'm speeding up a bit because I want to make sure we cover our research. So our first round of research was based on two focus groups working with Black advocates, people who do street outreach to serve Black drug users. This research is led by my colleague, Dr. Devin Banks at UMSL in the psychology department. Uh, and we are doing it together as a collaborative with our community advisory board, who you see pictured here. Uh, we just published this in the Harm Reduction Journal, but I will highlight the model from this research that emerged when we say what is driving this devastating racial disparity in overdose deaths in our region. We came up with uh, the 4S model, which essentially says the same things that are driving these disparities, if we address those, those are the th same things that are going to get us out of it. So People who are dying at the highest rates or who are the most vulnerable lack safety, security, stability, and survival. We call this the 4S model. There is a, needs to be a, a focus on meeting people's basic needs. People who are dying at the highest rates lack housing and secure shelter. They're not currently in the labor force and they have untreated chronic and physical mental health conditions. We also have a huge lack of social support networks for people who use drugs. This is a hugely stigmatized behavior still. Uh, and so people are very lonely and isolated. Uh, and also it's important to remember that drug use and addiction are not the only things that people are dealing with. In fact, this may be the least of someone's given problems on a day. Here's an illustrative quote from one of our participants. To go back to why are people using drugs? Have you seen what the world looks like for them? What else are they gonna do? If you have no source of stability, no safety, nobody that you can go to when you're struggling with impossible situations to make you feel like you can do this without drugs, then there's no safety for you. At least you can feel safe for a little bit. Bringing us back to our needs exercise. What does this do for you? So this was our grounded theory model that we pulled from this qualitative data. So I'm not gonna go into every arm of this model, um, but you see it also points to what the solutions are and what some of the broader driving contributing factors are, specifically systemic racism and the fentanyl contaminated drug supply. Here are uh, a few more quotes. I'll just read uh, one or two of them. I didn't go to school because I felt like I'm not going to be alive when I'm 21. Boy, you want me to spend four years of my life going to this high school? I'm not even going to be alive when I leave here. It's a waste of my time. That's how I felt. So I'm going to sell dope because it's like at least I can get something now. And when I die later, at least I had died with a little something more than what I had. 
We have people tell us on the regular, I'm ready to go, but what can I tell them? There's no place to go. I can get you on a waiting list. And then they back off using again. So what I will say is that there has been a tremendous amount of investment. Maybe I shouldn't say tremendous. That's a little generous. There has been investment in substance use services in North St. Louis City and County at an unprecedented level in the last two years, since many of our teams and collaborators and partners started highlighting the data, the racial inequities in deaths, but also capitalizing on the motivation and sort of the willingness to engage in these conversations from the summer of 2020 onward. And we really just haven't let up on the gas pedal. So we now have a lot more small black led organizations north of Del Mar that are getting some substance use funding, but it's still nowhere near this, this, at the scale that these massive healthcare systems and agencies that have been raking in with their you know locked in state contracts for decades and decades and decades that are not going anywhere. Again, where many of the people who are the focus of our research, do not feel safe and do not go to. So what are we doing with these insights? Priorities across our center initiative have been to change the narrative around drug use and people who use drugs, to promote safer use, not only having access to naloxone and fentanyl test strips, but things like wound care and how to take care of your skin and where to inject and where not to inject and also increasing service options. So our partners at the T and Family Care Health Center have funding through this initiative specifically to deploy harm reduction efforts to black men who use drugs. And we've seen just in incredible success in them being able to engage in trusting relationships with the people that they serve in ways that our mainstream systems have not been able to. Specifically, what do we recommend happens next? Uh, these are a little bit more in the weeds, but we've realized this is what you, this is the type of framing you need to give to funders and policymakers and decision makers. If you say, pay more attention to black communities and drug use, they say, tell me exactly what to do. If I knew what to do, maybe I would have done it already. So here's a snapshot of the types of recommendations that we've gotten through our community advisory board, our participatory research to now put on the desks of state and local policymakers who say they care about the overdose crisis and they care about racial inequities. And we say, okay, this is what the community wants to see. So where do we go from here? Uh, I will acknowledge that it looks like we are seeing a downturn in deaths for the first time in a long time. Early data from 2022 seems to show a decrease for the first time in years, including among black men in St. Louis. And I will say that Missouri's approach thus far to the overdose crisis has been pretty bold and innovative, at least for a Midwest, largely conservative state. Uh, we are competing with some states on the coast for the types of initiatives that we've uh, developed and disseminated. We've hugely expanded naloxone access and worked to implement the medication first treatment approach, which I did not really talk about at all today, but that's a, a, something I'm happy to talk about more on another day. Um, a reminder that we do have these effective medications for over opioid use disorder treatment, and we still do not use them nearly at the level that we need to. Uh, so we want to like keep our pedal to the metal in terms of low threshold access to medication treatment. And we should acknowledge that things have improved for in some ways for some people, but for some people more than others. Yes, we have gone from 17th in overdose rates to 20th. So I guess relatively that's promising. I guess if we're hoping other states get worse. I mean, that's not necessarily what we want. We want everybody to be getting better, but we also realize that this hasn't held true for everyone. And that when you disaggregate data by race, you see a very different story. So at the end of the day, what we really need across Missouri in every local community where people who use drugs, which is every community, we need a robust ecosystem of care. We should not be pitting one team or one approach against another necessarily, but we need to have access and homes for people who, no matter what stage of drug use and recovery they may be at. So yes, we need to legalize syringe access in Missouri and make sure we pop up syringe service programs all over the state. Yes, we need residential respite housing, transition housing, harm reduction housing, and sober living. Yes, we do need residential treatment. It's not clinically indicated probably for most people, but for some people it is, and it's basically non-existent in Missouri. Uh, we need peer support groups and community and people to feel a, a place where there's a collective and that people care about one another. 
Uh, we need transportation. So much of the time we hear that people can't get from one place to another because they don't have a way to get there. Our public transportation system is trash and people do not have their own vehicles. And yet we continue to place incredibly burdensome treatment attendance requirements on every one of these individuals and blame them when they don't show up. We also need care navigators or community health workers or peer specialists or advocates holding people's hands almost literally between each of these steps. Because unless we had someplace all under one roof that offered all these services, people need help getting from one place to another. And when they don't, they slip through the cracks. So just to remind everyone what we discussed and where we should be going, Remember, if you take nothing else from today, fentanyl is increasingly dominating our drug supply and we need to respond accordingly. People who use stimulants and other drugs need tailored harm reduction and treatment strategies too, not just opioid users. And we need robust ecosystems of substance use services in every community and those systems must center equity, relationship and dignity and meet people's basic needs. That's all I have today. I'd like to thank uh, my team. Uh, uh, here's some more websites you can check out, uh, other things we're doing, and I invite you to join the discussion. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I'm kind of at a loss for words other than to say thank you so much for this important and impressive work that you're doing. And we had an agreement that at 1240, I was going to give her a flashy oh, yeah. sign that it was 1240 and I couldn't bring myself to do it because I didn't want her to stop. I didn't want to hear her stop talking. Um, so now we're going to take questions. So I know there's been quite a bit of activity, I think, in the chat. So we're going to try to alternate between in-person and and um, the chat. And so, yeah, there we go. And just as a reminder for folks here in the audience to ask a question to be sure to get one of these mics first so that people on Zoom can hear. So I'm going to, I think I saw Ben's hand first over here. All right. Thank you, Dr. Winograd. Um, right here. Oh, hey. <laughs> uh, so I actually was just volunteering at the T last Friday. Awesome. Um, did their outreach up on MLK and I forget the other street, but uh, somebody there that I was volunteering with said they recently tested about 50 drug samples and every single one of them had xylazine in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of us have, have seen the New York times article that came out in, um, early January that was outlining this new problem of like xylazine is this animal tranquilizer that creates really terrible circulation effects on people's extremities. And so a lot of people who are using drugs are getting their extremities amputated because of it. Yeah. And so what are you and your team doing right now to address this thing that nobody knows what to do with? <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, so xylazine is really scary, uh, partially because no one really knows what the hell is going on. Um, as you said, there is definitely seems to be an association between xylazine consumption and these horrific wounds that pop up all over people's bodies, not necessarily even at the injection sites and even among people who don't inject. But if you snort or smoke it, you'll still get some wounds popping up. And medical doctors and scientists do not know the mechanism of what's going on in the body. Uh, we, What we are trying to stay as up to date as possible on is the best practices for caring for those wounds. So our team is working with Tycho Frost, who's a national harm reduction expert in wound care, as well as Dr. Punch, local experts, Nate Nolan, other people around the state to like advise us on how we should be talking about this and what types of supplies we can purchase and distribute. Sometimes that's our main role is we have funding to get actual materials and then give them out. So we have a, a pilot from the state. We purchased about $25,000 worth of wound care supplies and are figuring out how best to package them and give them out in a way that is safe and informative. Because we've also heard from these medical providers, like you gotta be careful, you, not just any Joe off the street can adequately care for one of these wounds. So you have to couple supplies with tailored education, uh, both for like street outreach workers who might be doing this, but then also for drug users themselves who might wanna take a supply box and go home and care for their own skin and wounds. Um, but other than that, and you know, supplying more information about safe injection practices, it's really hard to stay ahead of it. And this is just another signal of our poisonous, tainted and unpredictable drug supply. And that every time uh, you think you're cracking down on one thing, something else pops up. 
Thanks for that question. Um, I think you've answered most of the questions that were in the chat just throughout your presentation. So oh, thank okay. you so much for your for your talk. Um, one question that I think um, students and all of us alike kind of want to know is how we can get involved. And the specific question was if you need ongoing volunteer to pack and ship, and if so, where students can sign up. Oh my gosh, yes, do. my staff will be thrilled. Um, you know, I should have been prepared for this question. How embarrassing. Uh, yes, we are, our team is hosting packing parties is what we call them uh, for groups of volunteers or students or community partners. So did I put my email on here? Um, that would have been smart for me to do. I didn't. Oh, geez. Yes. Oh, what am I signing myself up for? Add it to the chat. Um, and then maybe also I will share my staff's point of contact information with you and they can um, put something out because that is something we absolutely want to join. Um, go ahead and also follow us on Twitter. Uh, I have those handles right here. DM us. Uh, we will respond and that can be a way to get a hold of us too. And join our listserv. So um, there's some action on it. You go to this website, nomodesk.org, uh, click in the top right corner to subscribe to our listserv. There's almost a thousand people on it from across the state of Missouri. We talk about overdose trends, questions. Sometimes there's controversy. Someone wrote me today. I know, Carrie, I got to respond to that. Uh, but you know, it's a good way to stay on top of what's happening and how you can get involved. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It was amazing. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so I know that you mentioned, um, syringe services not being legal in Missouri. What are some other policy barriers that you see coming up and maybe policy solutions we could learn from other states? Okay. Great question. I'm going to focus really uh, just on two things. So one is there is a syringe access bill introduced. Again, this is the seventh year in a row. Uh, this has been introduced by Doug Mann, a Democrat on the House side from Columbia. I don't remember the number of the bill off the top of my head, but hit me up and I'll share it, or you can Google it. And then there's a fentanyl test strip legalization bill sponsored by Senator Holly Rader, who's a Republican and historically has been leading the opioid focus bills, um, but she's not sponsoring a syringe one this year. I'm not sure why. Go to Jeff City and testify. I did it last year. It's hard because you get like really short notice and then it's like really nerve wracking. Um, what's happened though, and it's really tricky with syringe access bills is that they pass out of committee. Like they don't seem to be that controversial for most of session until the very end when they get tacked on to another bill that's really controversial or something gets tacked onto it. It's like it gets combined with Medicaid expansion. It's like, oh, then it tanks or something else that like people really have trouble with, even though a lot of this stuff is somewhat bipartisan, you know? Um, so I think just hammering home from different angles that the people want this and also making it clear that syringe access is not just about giving out sterile syringes all the time. It's about people in place. That's a quote from Caleb Bonta Green at Washington State, who was like, oh yes, that's how you talk about it. Op it opens doors for people who have no other doors to walk through. You can non-judgmentally serve people who are not interested, ready, willing, wanting to go into mainstream treatment or healthcare services, you can go to a syringe service program and get the care you need. And it also saves costs, reduces infectious disease rates, et cetera. So helping to testify for those two bills uh, at the state level, I'm almost done. And then locally pushing on our city and county officials to use their discretion where they're able to, because they can effectively decriminalize both of those things if they wanted to by getting our city and county prosecutors to say they will not prosecute people on any paraphernalia charges. That was done in Baltimore. It seems to be successful so far. We can put some more pressure on our local officials to do the same. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are right at one o'clock. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And let's please give Dr. Winograd one last round of applause. Thank you so much thank for you. being here. It was such a pleasure to have you here. And I think we all learned so much. Oh, so good. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. So I should have my contact info. I don't even have cards. Well, you know, I'm going to suggest to the crowd um, that instead of everybody kind of outreaching to yeah. you, maybe we could do like a coordinated thing here.